Thank you so much. Um, Salama Paji. <laughs> My name is Sarah Sewell, as just stated, and I serve in the United States, the, the United States Department of State, where I am, uh, as just described, the Under Secretary for Civilian Security, Democracy, and Human Rights. And I'd like to begin uh, by echoing the thanks to all of you for being here today, but of course, by thanking Venus University for hosting. Uh, a chance to share some thoughts with you and to have a discussion with you about whatever it is that is on your mind. Um, it's wonderful to be at an institution that has for some 40 years helped prepare the next generation of scholars and entrepreneurs and innovators here who have been building uh, the vibrant future that is Indonesia's. The future is extraordinarily bright for your country. Um, it's really remarkable, the progress that has been made over the last 50-some years. Indonesia's share of the global economy, as you know, has more than tripled. Life expectancy has grown by over 20 years. And following a long period of authoritarian rule, Indonesia has emerged as one of the largest democracies in the world. Just last year, over 130 million of your citizens peacefully voted to choose their president and their legislature. And this is an extraordinary series of accomplishments and a guiding light for much of the world. But we do have to remember that the progress that you have made, that your nation has made, it wasn't written in stone. Um, it was forged by the courage and the determination of countless Indonesian citizens who pushed to build a more democratic and inclusive society where everyone from the highest ranking official to the nasi goreng vendor on the street has equal rights and accountability under the law. Let me repeat, equal rights and accountability under the law. And although the process of democracy, the campaign rallies, the voting booths, these are often what receive the most attention. It is in fact these underlying principles of equality and accountability throughout society that give democracies power and meaning. Now changing times and new challenges can test these principles. And democracies always must continue to evolve to address the people's <coughs> needs while also holding fast to their fundamental <coughs> values. And this is as true in the United States as it is in Indonesia. Just as America's founders could not imagine the modern world of today, the young Indonesians marching for reform in 1998 could not foresee the issues your country now faces from an intensely competitive global economy to the rise of violent extremism, and to the perils of climate change. But those in the streets in 98 believed that a democratic society rooted in equal rights, the rule of law, and accountability would provide the stability and resilience needed for Indonesia to face future challenges. And so that's what I would like to discuss today with you, how staying true to democratic principles <coughs> makes both of our countries stronger more inclusive and just, but stronger, more competitive, and more secure in the 21st century. In the United <coughs> States, our incredible diversity is an enormous source of pride and strength. We're a nation of immigrants, and the fabric of our society, our culture, economy, politics, and everyday life is made stronger by contributions from all regions, all religions, and all ethnic groups. Likewise, Indonesia is defined by diversity. More than 17,000 islands, 300 ethnic groups, and many different faiths that enrich and strengthen your nation. Indonesia's philosophy of Pancasila reflects this diversity by recognizing six major faiths in the country, and at the same time, your constitution guarantees the freedom of religion for all. Because in the end, what holds our diverse societies together is equal rights and protection under the law. Equal rights gives every citizen 
a stake in their nation, and binds them together. But we do need to be honest. In our diverse societies, differences and agreements arise. And sometimes they, they get ugly, especially when cynical extremists seek to exploit what divides us. And in these cases, what matters is not the difference. What matters is how citizens and governments respond. When hateful voices condemn different political or religious groups, governments must protect them from discrimination and violence. And at every level of government, not just the national government, but local government, particularly in the context of a decentralizing political system. True democracy does not give way to a politics of fear or discrimination against difference. And that's why when bureaucrats look for excuses to discriminate against those who would express themselves um, or would delay their right to build a house of worship, civil society must speak up. In the United States, when police mistook a Muslim student's homemade clock for a bomb, our president, President Obama, spoke out and welcomed that student to the White House. Here in Indonesia, when extremists burned down a Protestant church in Aceh this past October, or when a mob attacked a mosque in Papua in July, President Jokowi condemned the attacks and ordered local officials and security services to strengthen protections for religious minorities. The trademark of democracy is not whether the majority prevails, but how it balances the interests of the majority with the fundamental human rights of each citizen. Now, law provides a framework for ensuring this balance. That means both enacting laws that are consistent with democratic principles and enforcing the law regardless of who violates it. This is the fundamental point. The rule of law is not just about having laws. The rule of law is about implementing laws. That's the role of police and of judges. And the integrity and effectiveness of these institutions is every bit as important as the letter of the law. But upholding the law can be difficult and controversial. Just last week in the United States, one of our most powerful politicians in New York State was convicted for fraud, extortion, and money laundering. This conviction, we didn't see it as evidence of failure. We saw it as evidence of the strength of our self-correcting, democratic, rule-based system. We've also seen recent cases of police violence in the United States, especially against minority groups. And our police and our courts are being forced to reckon anew with this behavior. Addressing deep-rooted corruption or injustice <coughs> might not have been possible during every period of our history. And powerful interests do not welcome the laws being applied <coughs> equally to all. But true accountability means shining a light in dark places and undercovering truths that many would prefer to leave alone. From the legacy of slavery in the United States to Indonesia's own dark period of violence in 1965. In fact, Americans today are still demanding the retirement of symbols of our racist past, just as many in Indonesia watch for a return of rhetoric from the nation's most violent days. In recent years, the Indonesian government has taken significant steps to promote justice and accountability within its own institutions. The separation of the national police from the military to strengthen civilian oversight is a terrific example of that progress. Indonesia established the Corruption Eradication Commission, or the KPK, an independent institution charged with investigating and prosecuting cases of corruption, no matter the status or the obstacles posed. The, the body has received global praise for its work, and many countries now study the KPK as a model. The government is also seeking to make government more responsive and transparent to its citizens, from how it answers complaints and requests for information to how it oversees procurement processes and extractive industries. I was speaking uh, just yesterday with one of the ministers 
who has on her cell phone the ability to get tips directly from citizens and to pass them on to the appropriate officials for action. This is a great example of what it means to be responsive in governance and open and transparent in your dealings. And the push to simplify bureaucracy is something that can both promote business interests and economic growth, as well as reducing opportunities for corruption. One of the key areas of partnership between the United States and Indonesia has been the Open Government Partnership, OGP. And this is a global platform that helps some 69 countries around the world improve transparency and accountability between governments and citizens. The United States shares its efforts and learns from others about how it can strengthen the bonds between citizens and government and Indonesia's innovative uh, steps are also part of the collective learning process through OGP. But OGP has a special place for civil society. And this is something that we really want to emphasize as we talk about the challenges that we face uh, in the realm of corruption, accountability, and transparency. Because citizens are, are a critical but often overlooked resource in the work of uh, anti-corruption. They're a powerful force for transparency and accountability in public life from directly monitoring government pro processes to defending anti-corruption bodies like the KPK when they face a backlash from powerful interests. Indonesia in particular is blessed with a vibrant and very active civil society. And during my visit, I've been fortunate to meet with representatives of impressive groups like Indonesian Corruption Watch and the Satara Institute for Peace and Democracy. As you all think about how to spend your time after graduation, whether you're from the international relations field or whether you're in business, you should consider supporting civil society groups, supporting your, with your time, with your energy, with your ideas, and if you're fabulously successful in business, supporting it, them with your resources. Our democracies need a strong civil society to continue raising hard questions, engaging citizens, and pushing governments to continue becoming more accountable, inclusive, and transparent. And particularly for the future business leaders, the work of civil society will be directly relevant to your own success. Because accountability and the rule of law are vital components of a healthy private sector, and a healthy market, and a healthy society. One study revealed that the costs of corruption can add 10% to the cost of doing business around the world. Imagine how this drags down Indonesia's or the United States or any country's potential to grow. In both the US and in Indonesia, it's small and medium businesses that represent more than half of our respected GDPs. And, it's, and corruption hurts these businesses the most because they have smaller margins. The cost of corruption can often push them directly to bankruptcy. And many of you know the stories, a construction company that won't pay kickbacks, but has trouble getting a contract then. Or a warung owner closes shop because she can't pay a bribe to pass inspection. The cousin of a government regulator gets the necessary permits, while his competitors get shut down. When these businesses lose because of corruption, consumers lose and taxpayers lose as well. You can help change that by creating a culture where success is determined by your innovation, by your hard work, by your character, not by participating in corruption. And in that environment, foreign businesses will be much more eager, creating additional jobs and opportunities for Indonesians in partnership with those who are in the country. And it's in that spirit that we welcome President Jokowi's recent announcement that Indonesia will seek to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TPP. This is a landmark trade agreement that includes very strong commitments to transparency and the rule of law in order to create powerful incentives to reduce corruption in both business and in government. This will, the TPP process will strengthen the ties between the United States and Indonesia by bringing our countries even closer together. And as President Obama 
leads the United States through a rebalance to the Asia Pacific, our nation's ties will continue to grow stronger. That's why after President Jokowi's recent visit and meeting at the White House, the two leaders announced that we would elevate our relations to a strategic partnership. And as partners, we will face a host of challenges. Some we know, like countering global terrorism, ending human trafficking, and curbing global climate change. <coughs> Others we can't predict. But we do know that our own practice of democratic values, our commitment to equal rights, to the rule of law, and to accountability will constantly be tested. So as future graduates of one of the country's best schools, you have a privileged role in deciding how Indonesia will respond to its next challenges. You're launching your careers at an amazing time in the country's history, enjoying freedoms and wealth that your parents might never have imagined. Your opportunity, your responsibility, is to defend the democratic values for which they struggled and to push onward to realize their vision of a more open, accountable, and ultimately stronger Indonesia. Thank you. Terima kasih, and congratulations to you who will be graduating next spring.